Thanks very much, Courtney. Welcome, and thank you very much for this invitation. It's especially rewarding to be in a, chosen by students from UC San Diego to be part of this event today. So how many of you have been to Tijuana? About half, it looks like. Well, I'm going to take you on a journey today to a Tijuana you've never seen before. This is the Tijuana River Canal. Might not look like much. We're in a drought. We're going to be in a drought a long time. You see that big wall over there? That's us. You see the other side? That's them. That little line really is part of the border. And this open area in the back is a sewer. And there's hundreds of people living in the Tijuana River Canal at any given time. And it might not be such a bad thing if you're a homeless person living in a place that's dry. But after a rain, it looks something like this. This is fetid, putrid, terrible smelling water. And it's basically an open sewer. And when our team started our research in Tijuana over a decade ago, we um, weren't able to go down in this place. It was a no-go zone. It was a place where the hidden people of Tijuana, the deported people, um, people who have um, drug histories, sex workers, there's an open drug market, um, they were living there. And so we knew that there was a lot of HIV risk, um, but we needed to measure it. We needed to see where people were living. So I gave people a disposable camera. And they took pictures of their lives. And this is an example. Um, many of these guys are deported from the United States. And during this period, 100 to 500 people were deported from the US to Mexico, and, and specifically to Tijuana every single day. A lot of these folks don't have any identification. They, have, they might not even speak Spanish because they grew up mostly in the United States. And their HIV risk is four times higher than other people living in Tijuana uh, with the same kinds of, of behavioral profiles. So, you know, when I started out as an epidemiologist, as a student about, you know, a couple decades ago now, um, I was studying at the cellular and molecular level. I was studying the virus. But my experiences in Tijuana have led me to think a lot differently. I no longer describe myself that way. And I'm going to tell you why. This is um, a, a photo of, of a woman named China. She's a participant in our study, and I, I like to say that all of the photographs that I'm showing you today are used with permission, and if I'm using someone's name, it's because they allowed us to. China is a sex worker. She's an injection drug user, and she's living in the Tijuana River Canal at this time. Um, Many of the sex workers that are living in this region are, are sex workers because they have children. 95% of them are, are in this situation because that's the only way that they um, can, can live. This uh, woman on, on the left-hand side is Martha Patricia. Very dear person to me, also a participant in our study. Martha Patricia is 57 years old. She's working here on the corner alongside some of the other girls in the Zona Roja, or the red light district in Tijuana, because it's, it's quasi-legal to practice sex work in, in this city, and like many cities in Mexico. Martha Patricia has HIV, hepatitis C, and active tuberculosis. She is homeless. A couple of months ago, I actually paid for her motel bill for a couple of months just because I couldn't bear the thought of her spreading TB un in unwittingly, uh, because she has nowhere to go. Now, when you put all of the data together that we've collected over the last decade, it's very interesting. This is a, a, you know, a graphic that shows HIV prevalence in the Americas by country. At the very top is Haiti. At the very bottom is Bolivia. Mexico, in the, the red bar there, is third from the bottom. So you look at the whole country overall, eh, HIV doesn't look like that big of a problem. The US is about halfway up there. And Tijuana is higher than both of them. So we see that this is a, a region of extreme risk. And it's not because people want to go around sharing needles and having unsafe sex. No, 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 no. We created the conditions that they are living in, by and large. And I believe that we have a binational responsibility to do something about it. 
Together with our colleagues from Mexico, we um, issued press releases after we collected the data that we did and showed that HIV prevalence is three times higher than the national average in uh, Tijuana. And uh, this gathered some attention and there was, um, uh, as you'll find out, some um, help and some aid in terms of funding for HIV prevention. My colleague, Dr. Sanjay Mehta in the Department of Medicine took all of the HIV positive samples we've collected over the last decade and he genetically sequenced them to determine their relatedness and so he could actually tell which virus is related to which um, and, and who was connected to who. He found five binational clusters of people that w had relations between both San Diego and Tijuana. And this really, to me, points in a very clear biological way that our epidemics are inherently linked. But more than that, he could actually determine the direction that the virus was headed. So in blue, you'll see over time, was the direction of HIV from San Diego to Tijuana. You can see that that's the way things were headed for most of the time because there's a lot of uh, migration north and those people often go south, whether they're doing so voluntarily or being deported. But now, more recently, we're starting to see blowback. In red are the um, infections that are going from Tijuana to San Diego. So we need to care about this, regardless of whether or not you care about the populations that I'm, I'm trying to represent today. We have this shared epidemic. Now, I'm going to share a little bit about some of our research with some photos and some videos. And in particular, female sex workers who are injection drug users have special needs because they can get infected with HIV through unprotected sex and through sharing needles. And so we developed an intervention study um, with the help of my husband, Tom Patterson, who's actually the big expert here. Um, we developed an intervention to try to promote condom use among the female sex workers who inject drugs. And when I um, approached the women, I had this video from the United States of a, of a woman sitting behind a desk showing people how not to share needles. And the sex workers from Tijuana looked at me and said, that doesn't speak to our reality. They said, we want to make our own video. So actually, all of the women in this um, photo here are sex workers who inject drugs in Tijuana. And they, we gave them a, a, a loose script and they made a whole story about um, HIV in a very short video. And I'm going to just show you a couple of stills from this, but if you want to see it, it's actually on the internet. So they all wanted to star in this. They all wanted their own names used. And it works like this. Okay, here's just a little piece. Hi, I'm Lily. We're going to show you how blood and viruses that are in one piece of injection equipment can contaminate other pieces of equipment using a special dye. This dye glows in the dark when we use a black light. Hi, my name's Laura. Here we have two syringes, and one I've placed a small quantity of dye to represent the blood that gets stuck inside a syringe after it's been used to shoot drugs. We'll see how the special dye goes from one place to another. Remember that dye represents infected blood. Don't forget a tiny amount of blood is enough to transmit HIV and Hep C. As you can see, with the assistance of the black light, everything is contaminated. The syringes, the plunger, the cooker, the cotton, the water, and even my fingers. So it was able to show that even if they're not sharing the needle, they're just sharing the water or the cotton, they can transmit infection. This intervention, which this video was a part of, was associated with a 95% reduction in needle sharing. So just because they're sex workers or drug users doesn't mean that they don't have the power to change their own behavior. Just give them the ammunition and the knowledge. But it isn't that easy. Unfortunately, there's many barriers in the social environment that make people um, at risk for HIV. And one of the biggest ones we found is the police. So here's just a couple of photos. Here on the left is a headline from one of the Tijuana newspapers about sexual abuse of, uh, that police are perpetrating on sex workers. Um, on the top is a wa waterboarding incident that was shot in the Tijuana River Canal. At the bottom is a scene that one of my staff shot from our um, project site of a uh, police officer beating up a suspect who was just sitting there do, doing nothing. And on the right is some of my staff that are being harassed by the police just for doing our research there. And this really, you know, got me thinking. If 
we're trying to tell people not to share needles, but it's really the police that are taking their syringes away and breaking it that drives them into shooting galleries. Maybe it's the police we should be focusing on and not focusing on the drug users themselves. So it also got me thinking, what happens to the police? My colleague, Dr. Leo Boletsky, has actually developed a police education program that bundles occupational safety with HIV prevention messages because when the police are frisking people like this, they get needle stick incidents, right? They get, they get stuck with the needle and they can get HIV or hep C. So this led us to the first ever memorandum of understanding with the police department and a university in the United States. And Proyecto Escudo, or Project Shield, is what we're doing now. And a couple of our PhD students are shown here with the Tawana Police Department. We're actually evaluating this HIV prevention program that bundles occupational safety with HIV prevention, and we'll tell you the news in a couple of years. We've also um, done some other work to make a difference. We took this uh, van and we donated it to our nonprofit organization that was helping us recruit participants for our studies. And when I said to them, you know, we're only doing uh, recruitment for uh, the people in our study during the day. At night, you can take this van and do whatever you want. I heard that Tijuana could really use a needle exchange. So they call it the Previmovil, so V-I-H is HIV in Spanish. And the Mexican government was so impressed with this idea that they decided to make a whole fleet of vehicles named after uh, the Prevamobile, and they're called the Condonetas. They um, are these little Renault vans. They've got these dancing caricatures of condoms all over them. They've got a loudspeaker on the roof, and they go down the Zona Roja going, Jeringues, condones, syringes, condoms. So in a pretty conservative country, this was a pretty nice story. We've also um, tried to intervene on another level as well, because access to health care is one of the most important problems that we're seeing in Tijuana. This is a photo taken of a fellow named Pedro, who was living at uh, the um, AIDS hospice, Las Memorias, in Tijuana. It was shot just a couple days before he died. He has a net over his face because he's too tired to even brush the flies away. And the man who's caring for him is not even a medical doctor. There's no uh, resources. And so this kind of picture was so common in the U.S. and other parts of the world, say, two decades ago. But when the advent of antiretroviral therapies, those drug cocktails we heard about in 1996, when those came on the scene, the AIDS hospices in the U.S. and Canada and other places shut down because they worked so well. In Tijuana, people like Pedro are still dying unnecessarily every single day, and he died within two days after this photo being taken. So that led, these problems led UCSD medical students to come to me a couple years ago. And they said, you know, could we, um, could we start a medical um, clinic in Tijuana? Because this was the reality we were facing. Um, we saw, for example, among the 191 people that had HIV, only half had ever been tested, and only 3% were ever uh, receiving antiretroviral therapy. So the student said to us, can't we help? And I thought, well, what a great idea. So I'm going to show you just a little bit about what they do. Let me see here. So the UCSD medical students, together with their counterparts from the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, they volunteer in this clinic. They're precepted by faculty from both schools, and they get course credit, and they, get, and they um, offer free care to the poor. Debo a tener fuerza, voluntad, no a las drogas y el medicamento. Yo sé que si lo, lo utilizo así, puede durar mucho tiempo. Les doy las gracias una vez más a los doctores y, y personas de Preven Casa que me han ayudado hasta aquí con mi tratamiento. Our work has been profiled in Science Magazine by John Cohen, um, the esteemed uh, Science uh, Magazine correspondent. But what I'm most proud of is that we've used this opportunity, this laboratory in Tijuana, as a training ground, not only for UCSD medical students and, and undergraduates in the global health major, for example, but also to train 
medical students and, uh, in Tijuana and practitioners in Tijuana. And I was surprised, I was looking at these slides the other day. This lady in the bottom right, I didn't know her at the time, but she received a diplomat or a certificate in Tijuana. And now she's actually a, a promotora working for us in the Tijuana River Canal, Susie Liao. She's just an example. We also were able to, with our data, advocate for funding so that the Global Fund uh, awarded Mexico $76 million for HIV prevention. So what is needed? There's still so much more that is needed to intervene in an epidemic situation like this. I think what you've seen today is that people don't make decisions in a vacuum. Their risk behaviors are shaped by the social, political, and economic realities that we create. And so we need to intervene on the risk factors of the risk factors if we're going to make a difference. One of the ways we can do this is to revisit something what's called the Merida Initiative, which was a bilateral agreement between the president of the time at, in the US and um, that of Mexico. And they have four pillars where they decided to combat the drug problem um, in Mexico. And these are shown here. The first three are really all about interdiction. And that's where most of the money has, been, has gone, which is billions of dollars. The fourth is to build strong and resilient communities. And that's where I think that we should be uh, advocating to have some of this, these funds reallocated to, to help prevent situations that, that drive the drug use and HIV epidemics that we see in the border region. So what we need, ladies and gentlemen, students, colleagues, and citizens of this globalized world, we need to create bridges and not walls. Not walls, ladies and gentlemen, not walls. With that, I will leave you, and if you'd like to hear more about the stories of our participants, tomorrowisalongtime.com and UCTV have uh, kindly uh, followed the stories of our participants in our projects. Thank you very much.